Welcome to the show. I am James Swanick. What is the failure rate or the success rate of conventional treatments as it relates to alcohol addiction, food addiction, cocaine addiction? We're going to be finding that out and more in today's conversation. Uh, we are joined by one of the world's top experts on addictions. In fact, our guest today has been working in the addiction field since 1976, before there was any addiction recovery industry on the West Coast of the US, at least. She's uh, incredibly familiar with, I guess, some might say the successes or failings of things like the 12-step program, traditional recovery, traditional treatments. And today we're going to put those traditional treatments under the microscope. Our guest today is Julia Ross, who is the author of three books, The Craving Cure, The Mood Cure, and The Diet Cure. Julia Ross is also the director of the Nutritional Therapy Institute's Virtual Clinic and Neuro Nutrient Therapy Training Programs. Julia Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to join you. Tell us a little bit about your background working in the addiction field. You told me that you've been doing that since 1976. I can imagine you've seen a heck of a lot of changes over the years. So would you just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us you know, what you've seen since the 70s? I'd be glad to. Uh, at the time that I was recruited as a graduate student to help create a program in uh, the only existing uh residential alcoholism treatment program in San Francisco, you know, a very large city. Um, it's a beautiful place, a four-story Victorian on a hill, but there was no program. It was, you know, a, a shelter, place to sleep, a place to eat, a place to be away from alcohol, and uh, a place to come back to after 12-step meetings. And the new director wanted more. He wanted something new, something to add to it, to give it more success, you know, to give the residents some real uh, structure and an insight and hope. And we leaped at the opportunity to create the programming. I had a wonderful time, created a very, very rich program, much more intensive than anything that exists today. Plus the program was long-term. People could stay as long as they wanted. When I first came to uh, work there, there was somebody who'd been there for six years. Um, but most people stayed between one and two years. And we created programs for their families so that they could start working things out before they went home, um, helping codependents, as we call them, with their own issues. Um, it was just a very rich, exciting time. And in the meantime, the alcoholism treatment industry was moving into the area in general and uh, was at that time entirely hospital based. So, the, the, you know, the, the costs were tremendously high, but insurance, you know, for some years paid for it. And what they did was to import the Minnesota model, which had been developed for some years and had about a 50 percent success rate with alcoholism uh, in, in the Midwest. Um, they adopted it for, you know, all of their corporate programs and uh, increasingly um, privately owned residential programs cropped up uh, that also um, adopted counseling programs to add to 12 step and uh, residential structure. Um, and that, uh, as I say, had a 50% success rate and all of us were dealing mostly with alcoholism at the time. But in the early 1980s, crack cocaine hit. So the epidemic, which is now in its you know, 40 years uh, raging uh, still, um, basically um, showed us that all of our work, all of our techniques were useless. Uh, across the country, all of us were reporting 100% relapse rates within 24 hours. Um, and fortunately, uh, we started hearing, uh, a voice, uh, calling in the wilderness, uh, letting us know that 
the problem we were dealing with, the failure that we were dealing with had to do with the fundamental cause of addiction, which is neurotransmitter deficit. So the brain is really the core of the problem. Not that other things don't contribute to it, psychological problems, you know, financial problems, whatever, uh, genetics um, contribute to it. But the real core uh, of the problem, which gets worse over time uh, when alcohol or any other substance is being used, um, makes it almost impossible to recover because the brain doesn't recover without very specific help. And um, fortunately, uh, some of the scientists, uh, the neuro neuroscientists, the brain scientists, um, were ready to talk about what help might be accessible to us. Um, and one of them in particular, uh, a PhD named Kenneth Blum wrote a book called Alcohol and the Addictive Brain, uh, where he talked about the fact that the four primary neurotransmitters that control our moods and our appetites uh, were all, uh, oftentimes, all under functioning. And so the negative moods continued and the need for substances to relieve them continued. And he introduced us to some very simple nutritional uh, strategies because it was well known in neuroscience that uh, the brain was fueled by specific nutrients, just as every other tissue and function in the body is fueled. For example, muscle. The scientists who, who, uh, who study muscle are very interested in what composes muscle. What are the nutrients that are needed to build muscle or repair muscle? So the th same thing is true of the brain, and it was very well known at the time, uh, at this point in the 1980s, that uh, the, the nutrients that were needed uh, are called amino acids, um, come from protein, uh, and that there were only a handful required to repair uh, this uh, defective a malfunctioning brain chemistry. And so I began uh, using it after conferring with colleagues in uh, the Midwest and back East who had already started uh, implementing it, finding it was successful, successful. I already had a nutritionist on staff. Uh, she researched it and we began using it. And the first week that we used it with a crack cocaine addict, we saw tremendous responsiveness. Am I hearing you correctly that we can destroy much of the pain and suffering from these drug epidemics we have by simply eating the right nutritious foods? Well, yes, but um, the the deficiencies in the brain chemistry that result from addiction are quite deep. So um, we would have to be provided with a very strongly protein-based diet, uh, three time, protein three times a day, and protected from our cravings while the uh, brain chemistry gradually built up. Instead, what the uh, early neuroscientists discovered was that we could use supplements, uh, concentrates of these five amino acids that were required mm. to restore the brain and that those took effect almost immediately. So that while they're getting their diet turned around and starting to eat more protein, they're already in the process of repairing whatever neurochemistry was malfunctioning. Mm. So interesting. The five amino acids you reference, what are those amino acids? Well, let me uh, start with the amino acid that enlightened me uh, in the midst of the, of the crack cocaine epidemic. Mm. Uh, we had a client, a new client, um, highly motivated. He was still employed at the post office. Um, his family was involved in the program. Uh, this is an intensive outpatient program we're talking about here. And uh, he had already been to five other programs, some of them residential, some of them outpatient, 
uh, and had been unable to sustain any degree of um, sobriety. Um, and so we asked him whether he'd be willing to be a guinea pig, that we were starting something that we that was promising that might give him something different than he'd ever had before. And he said, and we told him that it was amino acid supplements. It was a nutritional approach. And he said, oh, that'd be great because I was a bodybuilder before I got into crack and I took amino acids then. Uh, yeah. You know, that bodybuilders typically do that to build up their muscles, which are also composed of amino acids. So we gave him one of the five amino acids that's needed because when we're talking about stimulant addiction, whether it's cocaine or methamphetamine, uh, there's only one part of the brain that's uh, really impacted. And that's the part of the brain that naturally stimulates us, allows us to focus, gives us, you know, that uh, ability to be uh, mentally alert and functional. Um, and physically, too, it programs uh, muscle movement. Um, so that part of the brain is uh, produces something called the catecholamines, which is a collection of neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, and adrenaline, which we all know. Um, and all of them are fed by one amino acid, and it's called tyrosine. So we got him a bottle of tyrosine to take home, uh, and uh, he took it three times a day, morning, mid-morning, mid-afternoon. Didn't take it at night because he wanted to sleep. Uh, and it's stimulating. Uh, and we waited for a week. A week later, he came back and told us that it was the first week he had had in five years where he didn't use. Uh, no crack that week. And then he told us an incredible story, which was, he said, not only did I not use, but I passed the big test. Um, the post office was trying to finally get rid of me. And they sent me on a 45 minute delivery with a driver who was my dealer, my drug dealer. This was all known, but they couldn't prove it. So they couldn't get rid of these guys uh, on the job, but they were ready with a drug test for as soon as I got back because they knew that I wouldn't be able to withstand this. And indeed he said about 10 minutes into the drive, he pulled out uh, a joint of, crack cocaine with marijuana, which was this guy's favorite form of, of, uh, of high. And I knew right, he said, I knew right then that I was done for and that it was my family would, this was the last try for my family. I wouldn't have a job, you know, that would be the end of my life. Um, and then he said, and five minutes later, I realized that I'd forgotten that he had the joint in his pocket. Mm. I didn't need to have it and I didn't have it and I did the drug test and I was clean. And uh, we knew at that moment, you know, that we had stumbled on something that was priceless. And so we continued to use the, the uh, tyrosine with all of our crack cocaine addicts with great success. They were also having great success in other programs that were utilizing this new technology, basically nutritional technology. Uh, and then we began to work, uh, get familiar with the other amino acids that would correct other parts of the brain that someone, for example, who was an alcoholic, who was drinking to relax. Well, relaxation comes from another part of the brain and it's produced by a, a neurotransmitter called GABA, which uh, is available as a supplement. Yes. Uh, it's an amino acid as well as a neurotransmitter. And we began to use that for anyone for whom stress was a big primary uh, motivator for, for drug or alcohol use. Uh, and again, we hit a different jackpot, a different part of the brain that needed correction to be uh, functioning optimally. And the supplement of GABA, um, which is particularly uh, only needed in very small amounts, um, provided it very quickly. Um, we would send people home with the GABA. They would take it three or even four times a day because it could help with sleep. Um, and again, 
we would get these incredible reports, you know, with slashed cravings. And uh, so that was two out of the five. Uh, Julia, so just before you continue, may I just ask you to um, avoid to touching the table when you speak the sound? Oh, that, that that's make... very hard for me to do because I'm not conscious of doing it. But <laughs> <laughs> you're not the first person who's asked, but I'll try. Yeah, oh, no, oh. <laughs> it's just it set, picks up on the microphone and it makes the listening experience a little bit compromised. Um, <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah, we've got so we've got tyrosine uh, and we've got GABA. Yeah, GABA is amazing. I've taken GABA myself. Uh, it's a very calming uh, supplement. Um, and for those who've struggled with sleep, sometimes they, uh, many people have found that taking some GABA has enabled them to fall asleep quicker and, and sleep deeper. I can just share that anecdotally. Um, I wasn't aware of uh, tyrosine, and I've since Googled it as you were as you were talking there. Very interesting. So we've covered two. We've got tyrosine and we've got GABA. And just for the listener, just a reminder, we're speaking with Julia Ross, who is the author of The Craving Cure, The Mood Cure, and The Diet Cure. And uh, Julia has been working in the addiction field since 1976. Uh, what's the third? amino acid Julie. okay so we have the the amino acid tyrosine which uh is perfect for someone who is using to get energy and enthusiasm and focus um we've talked about a natural tranquilizer gaba which is in order if if someone is using for stress relief so then there's another uh amino acid uh solution to uh, the problem that drives uh, in, the addiction to any substance that affects the opiates. So our natural opiate is endorphin. And that's our natural pleasure, comfort, joy, chemistry, pain killing. Uh, very potent. But when the levels drop too low, we need help from something else. Alcohol can definitely bring some temporary comfort and joy because among other things, it it uh, uh, affects the endorphin levels and raises them up temporarily. Um, but uh, obviously opiates, uh, any kind of actual painkiller, um, THC uh, is uh, quite can be quite potent on the endorphin uh, function. Um, so uh, the the final and and really the biggest killer uh, that uh, thrives on endorphin relief is sugar. Uh, so comfort foods uh, are acting on the endorphin receptors in the brain um, mm. to temporarily give us that that sense of comfort. Some of our clients call their their bread or their ice cream or whatever their best friend, um, just as people call alcohol, you know, um, quite often. So the amino acid that um, helps to retain and build up uh, our natural endorphin stores um, is called D-phenylalanine, the letter D, phenylalanine. So it's, a, uh, it's available in two different um, formulations, D-phenylalanine and another mixed formulation called D-L-phenylalanine, which is a little more stimulating. Um, at any rate, uh, we get the same kind of dramatic results with that when we have somebody who's uh, drinking alcohol to kill pain, whether physical or emotional, um, or eating toxic foods to get a similar effect. Um, and the same kind of reports that we get on the other two amino acids um, uh, come flooding in uh, when when people are responding about their need for comfort food that's suddenly gone, their need for uh, pain killing, whether it's from alcohol or drugs, is 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 really reduced. Mm. So that is makes it, three. Is that is that commonly referred to as DLPA in a supplement uh, form? There's DPA and and DLPA. Got it. So DPA and DLPA. And they're and, they're a little harder to find, but all of these things are available on Amazon. You know, 
Yeah, I'm just I just Googled it right now on Amazon, actually, and I can see them available here. I can see DLPA and I can see L uh, phenyl phenylalanine. But are you seeing D phenylalanine? Um, I'm seeing DL and I'm seeing DLPA powder. Uh, but you haven't it's... found the DPA by itself. So um, I can give you a couple, a couple of companies that make it. Uh, one is called Montif, M-O-N-T-I-F-F. -F. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another one, um, Doctor's Best. Okay. Okay, got it. Which is much cheaper. Uh, works fine. <laughs> okay, very good. So we've got tyrosine, GABA, DPA, and DLPA, which is number three. And we're working down these five amino acids here. What's the fourth one? Well, the fourth one um, has to do with um, the supply of glucose to the neurotransmitters. So the brain is responsible for keeping these neurotransmitters going by supplying glucose at every moment of every day. And uh, particularly when our diet isn't good, whether we're not eating enough or we're eating too much sugar and starch so that our, our uh, blood sugar spikes and then drops too low, uh, the supply to the neurotransmitters reduces and people start feeling that neurotransmitter deficiency um, depression, anxiety, stress, cravings. Um, and that, uh, that situation certainly needs a dietary solution. We got to take in real food, uh, not sugar and starch uh, throughout the day, you know, at least three times a day. But there is an instant solution as well. And that is uh, one of the most researched amino acids there is um, of all 20 that exist. It's called glutamine, uh, and mm -hmm. glutamine has many, many uh, extraordinary uh, healing properties. But the thing that's so important with alcoholism and, and sugar addiction is that it is intended to very instantly and sensitively convert into glucose if the cells are in trouble, you know, if the glucose supply drops. And people can feel it. They it tastes good actually, and they they uh, they take it sublingually, and almost instantly the craving reduces. They feel balanced and level, and not stressed and uh, having trouble focusing and irritable and so forth. Um, so that's another you know really important one for um, for the uh, for the alcoholic. Who's, yeah. who needs some relief. Glutamine, yeah. Supplies, it, so it helps support uh, the supply of glucose to the brain neurotransmitters. Yes. Okay, great. All right. We're up to the num number five here, Julia. We've got tyrosine, GABA, DPA and DLPA. We've got glutamine. What's the fifth amino acid here? Um, well, um, I'm blanking. <laughs> Can you turn this off for a second? <laughs> uh, no problems at all. <laughs> this has never happened before. That's all fortunately. Right. I'm at the 2340 mark. That's fine. <laughs> what am I leaving out? Oh, the one I usually start with. <laughs> this is our natural antidepressant. Uh, the neurotransmitter called serotonin, probably the best known of all of the brain neurotransmitters because there are so many drugs now uh, marketed to increase the, the function of serotonin in the brain. Uh, and people are pretty clear that the drug effect is almost always only partial, you know, that you never get the complete uh, repair, but the nutrient that uh, is directly used by the serotonin producing cells is uh, tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan. Mm. 
And tryptophan is again available uh, at you know all health food stores. And um, there is a, there is a second form of it uh, called 5-hydroxytryptophan or 5-HTP, uh, which works better for some people. Um, about 80% of people do equally well on both in terms of relieving depression, that kind of negative, pessimistic um, thinking, hopelessness, um, irritability, mm. um, anxiety, uh, phobias. Um, there's a, a sleeplessness. There's a wide range of, of uh, deficiency symptoms with serotonin, longer than any other neurotransmitter deficiency, because mm. out of tryptophan, then we get serotonin, and serotonin produces not only sunny moods, but it turns into melatonin, which is our sleep uh, yes. provider. Yeah, and you can get a lot of tryptophan on Thanksgiving day because everyone's eating a turkey and there's lots of tryptophan in turkey so people i think mistakenly believe that they're tired because they're eating large quantities of food i would propose that most of the reason they feel tired is because they're eating turkey which has got large amounts of tryptophan right julia well yes but the the truth is that um any animal protein uh contains tryptophan uh, in pretty good amounts uh, as opposed to plant proteins. So for example, there's a lot of use of protein powders now, and we've been concerned because only whey protein provides adequate tryptophan. The plants tend not to have much, if any. So mm. <clears throat> uh, peas are probably the best uh, source in the, the plant protein powder category, but uh, you'll notice that even collagen protein powders have almost no uh, tryptophan. And there's been some concern among bodybuilders who have noticed becoming more depressed uh, using high amounts of plant protein powders. Yes. And that when they switch to whey, um, they get better, uh, mm. better mood. So I take it then you're a meat eater. Yes. Um, yes. uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, I think that I, I've just explained that of the three kinds of foods, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, it's the proteins that are the most important for neurotransmitter repair. Mm. And we just can't get a concentrated protein um, from, for example, beans. Uh, it takes a huge amount of, of uh, legume to eat equal the amount of a single chicken breast, for example. Um, mm. So people are, it's hard for them to eat enough of the, you know, whole um, legumes, you know, lentils, beans, and so forth, or whole grains, which have a smaller amount, but still do have protein. Um, so it's interesting, uh, just, to, just to, uh, um, an additional thought there. Years, some years ago, I, was in a romantic relationship with a woman who was not a meat eater and we would cook together. And most of her cooking was legumes and beans and lentils. And I had three gout attacks that year. And, uh, and I came to find out subsequently, I didn't realize this until some years later that, um, my uric acid levels were extraordinarily high. Um, because those foods, lentils and beans, example, uh, create a lot of purines in the body, which rises the uric uric acid content. And uh, our hypothesis, you know, subsequently was that it was that high, it was that change in diet where I was eating a lot of that stuff that gave me gout attacks. And a lot of people say, well, you get gout attacks from drinking too much alcohol or for eating too much meat. I don't drink alcohol at all. So it couldn't have been the alcohol that was giving me the gout attacks. And, and it I couldn't wasn't have been meat. <laughs> and it, couldn't have, it could not have been meat either because my meat uh, consumption dropped to maybe meat once every week or two. And then subsequently I, I've switched back to meat based. Uh, and uh, I actually have taken candidly a, a prescription drug in addition to eating meat, which is the first time that I've actually surrendered to, okay, give me a prescription drug, which is called allopurinol. 
an allopurinol drops uric acid in the body and my uric acid levels have dropped noticeably and I have not had a gout attack. Now, I am open to feedback from anyone who could tell me what the consequences are of taking such a drug, but certainly I was I seemed to be unable to prevent gout attacks from diet alone. And that was a eye-opening experience for me because I always used to think I was Superman and I could fix everything with just, you know, strong dietary choices. But on this occasion, I decided to experiment, tried this drug called allopurinol. And so far it's been, it's done wonders because I actually have measured my allopurinol levels that went, I'm, I'm sorry, my uric acid levels. My uh, uric acid levels went from extraordinarily high, 8.8 and almost overnight dropped down, it's not overnight, I'm sorry, I think 40 days, 45 days or so, it dropped down to the fives, which is a, a much healthier range. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I inserted my side story into what you were sharing, Julia, but I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Well, on what uh, I, I just wanted to be clear. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this. Uh, your uric acid levels continued to be high even when you went back to meat? Yes, so you eliminated the legumes altogether? Yes. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is that one of the ways that we help people personalize their diets is to find out what their blood type is. And we've found that the two major blood types, uh, type O and type A, um, really do uh, program in differences in uh, tolerance for for food. Mine's Do you know o, what your blood type is? O, o positive, yeah. yeah. So um, O's uh, are the, it's O for original. It's the original blood type. It's basically, you know, the paleolithic blood type. Yeah. And at that, at the time of its origination, we were living, eating paleolithic foods. You know, we were yeah. eating meat and whatever, uh, you know, roots, fruits, nuts and seeds, and uh, vegetables were available uh, since we were not cultivating anything. So uh, that's still true. And people with an O blood type do not seem to be able to break down the more recent foods like legumes and whole grains that were yeah. cultivated starting about 20 to 30,000 years ago at which point the A blood type originated, which was adapted to the, what I call the herder planter diet. So they still had animals that they were eating, but they were growing their own plants um, and not depending on the seasonal availability. Yes. And um, so uh, what we found with them is that yes, they tolerate uh, the more modern foods like whole grains and, and legumes well, but uh, they don't make uh, adequate hydrochloric acid to break down red meat in particular. And because their hydrochloric acid uh, level tends to be lower, they're more vulnerable to disease because they don't kill the bugs in the stomach uh, as effectively as O's do. And so typically we uh, give them some combination of hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes in something called super enzymes and then they're able to uh, eat anything and, uh, and you know, be, protect their health um, in, at the same time. Uh, and so, you know, we're always looking for ways to help people identify what for them is the right diet, not what's the fad at the moment, but what's for them the right diet. And so for you, uh, we would know right away that, that you and your girlfriend would have to eat differently and uh, yeah. probably could have spared you the problem with gout. I don't know why it hasn't gone away. Um, we have not had to deal with gout in our clinic. We have well, a virtual yeah. clinic. The, my, the, my gout attacks reduced subsequently and noticeably when I returned to a meat diet, but it, it certainly wasn't eliminated. But where I had four in a year, it went back to one every 18 months subsequently. And then since I've been on the allopurinol, nothing's happened. I haven't had any problems. And I, I actually, anecdotally, I'm not sure if I can ever prove this, but one of the gout attacks came after I ate a considerable a number of anchovies on a pizza. One night I had a pizza and anchovies. And then the next day I had a gout attack and I came 
to realize with subsequent research that anchovies have the highest uh, amounts of purines in it, which can then raise, can spike the uric acid levels very quickly. Fascinating, because it probably wasn't very much on a no, pizza. No, well, I mean, I, I have a big appetite, Julia. Oh. I had a big family-sized pizza by myself, and there were at least three <laughs> anchovies on each one of those slices. But I, I think it was enough to cause a gout attack. You know, yeah, so, clearly. But I, 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 thankfully, I have my blood work done now every quarter, at least uh, every four, maybe four or five months now, and my uric acids are way low now. Um, and also, just a side note: since I've been eating, um, I eat considerable amounts of red meat now, or at least I have the past year. I've been eating uh, a four hundred and fifty gram piece of grass fed steak four times a week for about um let's call it six months or so my testosterone levels have have gone over a thousand and which is incredible and i put it down to a combination of things sunlight exercise good sleep doing heavy uh weights in the gym but also i would probably submit increasing my steak uh grass-fed steak consumption but anyway we don't need to make this a james swanick dietary uh investigation <laughs> we're, we're talking about helping folks who are trying to reduce and stop drinking what they can do with it sounds like supplementation um which let's just review that and then i'd like to ask how we can get those same amino acids from food if we were not going to go to amazon and buy these supplements how can we get them from food? But first of all, let's just review it, if we if we may. Um, the five amino acids that you were uh, referencing are tyrosine, which helps the neurotransmitters for focus, GABA, uh, which obviously reduces stress, DPA and DLPA, um, which helps to retain natural endorphins, glutamine, which helps supply glucose to the brain, and then tryptophan or 5-HTP, which helps create serotonin and all of those things you're submitting, Julia, if someone was to increase those amino acids, either by supplementation or by food, which we'll, we'll get to in a second, can help reduce people's cravings for alcohol. That's what you're putting forward. Yes. Yes. Um, initially we would give the recommendation and wait a week to get a report, you know, on the effectiveness. And then we would, you know, um, alter doses if we needed to, you know, raise them or lower them or whatever. But the, uh, after a few years, we decided to do trials of amino, of amino acids in the office in our virtual clinic. And so we would send a trialing kit to people. We still do this. And, uh, and then we would meet with them on Zoom and they would open the capsule in their mouth, swish it around in their mouths, uh, for just a, you know a minute or so, and uh, and then start reporting in on any changes that they noticed. And the longest we ever had to wait was probably four minutes. Usually, the effects are obvious within two minutes. Um, and this became you know just an instant feedback. You know, is this good for you? Is this right for you? What's the dose for you? And so when we made our recommendations for daily use for, uh, you know, for adults, uh, alcoholic adults, it'd be six months to a year that they would continue to need the supplements in addition to building up the quality of their diet and the amount of protein in it. Um, so that was, you know, a huge advance in uh, their motivation because they could see instantly, yes, and eventually, just recently, last few years, I've been posting on my YouTube channel interviews uh, of volunteers who try the aminos and then are filmed and describe, you know, in real time uh, what their responses are. Um, so these amino acids can have almost instantaneous effect. Yes. That's incredible, isn't it? I would have thought that you would have needed like a 30-day, 60-day, 90-day protocol, but just changing it that quickly could have, it seems, almost instantaneous results. The, the way I, I discovered this was um, uh, an alcoholic who, uh, Native American, 
Uh, he was brought in by the staff of the tribal clinic because he had relapsed so many times. He'd gone to very elaborate, beautiful Native American run uh, residential treatment programs. And within three days, which is their standard uh, experience, uh, he would be uh, drinking again. Um, and so they brought him down to my clinic and they brought a camera. They wanted to record the, you know, the process and his counselor was there and the head of the clinic was there and he was there and he was so depressed that he couldn't talk. So I couldn't introduce him. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't get any information from him other than what he looked like and his inability to talk. And they said, well, yeah, <laughs> we've had that problem too. Anyway, so we decided to give it to him. And we knew that sublingual absorption was faster than if he swallowed a capsule. So we just asked him to open the capsule in his mouth and swish the water. And the, and this is true of all Native Americans we've ever worked with. Uh, almost instant and very vivid response. His eyes started to track. He started to get restless and move around in his chair and he was able to talk. Um, and so I could proceed and that amino acid was tyrosine. And in mm. fact, alcohol had a very energizing, enlivening effect on him. Uh, and that's what he was needing. Um, with somebody else, it would have to be cocaine or meth, you know, uh, to get you moving. But with him uh, and, and a lot of alcoholics, wouldn't you agree, drink to get lively and fun? And yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, so that was my lesson in how quickly the amino acids could take effect. We'd only use them as capsules that people took when they went home uh, up until so then. If, if this is, and just for the listener, I do want to, I want to make sure I do get to the foods that we can eat to naturally boost these amino acids. If this is what you're seeing and experiencing, why are the traditional methodologies of recovery, prevention, helping people out of addiction. What, why are those, why are those amino acids not put forward so prominently and we're stuck seemingly in these traditional methods, which by all accounts still have an appallingly low success rate? Well, um, I'd like to answer that question uh, with the answer that I was given by uh, the director of one of these hospital-based treatment programs in the Bay Area. Uh, I was leaving after 14 years uh, the agency in San Francisco and I was moving to the adjacent county and opening my own private program, which focused on the, uh, the, the use of nutrition and supplementation uh, in addition to all the other things that, that were helpful. Um, and the director of this hospital program, uh, which, you know, had the standard treatment model, um, still used today, uh, took me out to lunch and said, I wanted to share with you the things that have made us successful and that I was trained, uh, to do, to keep, uh, the census up. Um, and so the first thing that I want to suggest to you, although I will deny that I ever said this, if you ever tell anyone, is to do not create a strong aftercare program. Uh, usually people make great connections. They, they love their fellow, you know, sufferers in the programs. They love the staff and they will come back if they get in trouble. But if they don't get in trouble, they won't come back. And so our biggest population of clients is relapsers. And we can't get relapsers unless we reduce the quality of our program. Wow. And subsequently, yeah. um, I've had former colleagues who went to work in some of these, you know, really large corporate um, uh businesses, you know, that, that have bought up many uh, treatment programs and they've said the same thing. They, you know, I've said to them, you know, how effective the aminos are. You've used them. You use them yourself when I knew you way back. Uh, why, you know, 
why can't you be persuasive to get them integrated, you know, at least a pilot program, something. And she said the same thing. She said it would be too effective. Mm. It's uh, it's an example of much of the criticism that many have about the US healthcare system, which is focused on well, let's just say it's not focused on prevention, is it? It's focused on uh, helping people who are already sick rather than preventing them from getting sick in the first place. There's no money in prevention when you compare it to, or there's, uh, sorry, there's little money in prevention compared to trying to, uh, you know, support someone who's already suffering. You know, uh, you bring up a, a, another point when you say that um, another problem is that so many people who work in these programs have been able to stay sober themselves. And so if someone relapses, they judge them. They don't really understand that it's a biochemical imperative, that addiction is by definition uh, a willpower killer. Um, it's a biochemical barrier that is tremendously powerful and it, it really insuperable for most people. Mm. That's yeah. why uh, my most recent book is called The Craving Cure and it's targeted towards food addiction, which is the same dynamic. People cannot stop eating the foods that are making them obese and diabetic. They want to, they need to, they're smart, they're motivated. Food addicts are typically pretty stable in their life uh, lifestyle, but they can't because it's a biochemical imperative. Mm -hmm. And it's only a biochemical solution that can provide the solution to the biochemical core of the problem. All the other things in treatment are great, but it's just missing this understanding that allows us to have compassion for people who are addicted. How do we get these amino acids from food, Julia? Well, it's uh, these amino acids are only available in uh, foods that contain protein. So there's currently sort of a romance with what are called plant-based diets. Uh, well, sugar is a plant. Chocolate is a plant. <laughs> Wheat is a plant. You know, sugar, starch, chocolate. The fundamentals of the junk food diet, you know, are all plants. Uh, there is no reason to be romantic about it. We've got to be realistic. Um, and the reality is that we have been eating animal protein on this planet for 2 million years. We are animals and we are omnivores, meaning we need both animal and plant foods. Um, it's, a, it's not a popular uh, <laughs> a statement of fact, but... Um, we see people who really want to be vegan for, you know, really admirable reasons. You know, who wants to kill anything, you know, and then eat it? You know, it's a disgusting concept, but we are animals and we have to have the same compassion for ourselves as we have with our dogs, you know, uh, or cats. Um, so at any rate, uh, the, uh, the, the amount and the number of amino acids is greater in animal protein. So there are 20 amino acids. Nine of them are essential. In other words, we can't, they can't be made out of anything else. And uh, one of them, tryptophan, is extremely hard to get except in animal protein. Mm. And I believe that's why the uh, depression um, epidemic started, uh, was because we stopped eating the same amount of animal protein that we had in the 1970s when we became terrified of fat and animal protein contains saturated fat. So there was a mistaken idea that saturated fat was the cause of heart disease and uh, we went towards carbs and our protein consumption as well as our fat consumption went down. But then the fat increased because we were eating vegetable source fats instead of saturated fats.
um, and there are problems with that, but uh, we, we're sort of left with this blank area where nobody really wants to talk about protein. They talk about plants, which are primarily carbohydrate and fiber, um, and, uh, and fat, you know, if, if there's a keto diet, but even with keto diets, there's very little attention typically brought to bear on our need for protein. But because amino acids are critical for recovering people, we have been uh, looking at this uh, need for concentrated protein in the food uh, mm. three times a day. And uh, we always found that if people eat animal protein three times a day, the amounts may differ. Um, that their recovery is faster and stronger. Mm. So if I'm going to the restaurant tonight and I've got a choice of grass-fed steak, chicken, salmon, vegetables, potatoes, uh, I'm not going to include fries and things and carbs, right? I'm just going to I'm just going to say like stuff that is all source of protein, and then there's some vegetables. What what is the best meal that I could order? to help my neurotransmitters, which in turn would help reduce or eliminate cravings that I might experience. What's the Rolls Royce well, of dinner meals, Julia? Well, we found that it, you know, it really is a matter of taste and of blood type, you know, so a, a type A would typically choose chicken or fish because they digest them better. Uh, a type O typically likes beef uh, and digests it magnificently. <laughs> um, so in terms of difference in quality, um, we haven't really noticed that. Quantity and what the individual um, impulse is. And we've noticed that with blood types, that, you know, that's a very good way to help people understand their own in, you know, inclinations when it comes to eating. So if you're an O blood type like I am, you're probably gonna have a desire for beef and if you're an A, you might favor chicken and fish. And then vegetables, are uh, all vegetables created equally or are there some that you would avoid, Julia? Um, I haven't noticed that anyone uh, uh, needs particular guidance on vegetables. Um, fruits, it, it's mostly the, uh, the amount uh, they can become addictive because they contain um, high fructose corn syrup, essentially their own uh, free fructose is found in fruit. And so they can become addictive. And if you've already been addicted to alcohol, it, you're a little more, uh, you're significantly more apt to become addicted to carbs in sobriety. So starches, fruits, sugars, and so forth. One of the things that our clients share with us when they stop drinking alcohol and they're going through our stop drinking process is that they start craving sugary foods. And some of those examples are ice cream and chocolate. What's going on there that's having them crave that? And how would you treat that? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it's really important to know what they crave. Because um, some of them will say, well, anything sweet. Um, but a lot of them, as you say, have specific weaknesses, they would say, uh, or habits. And uh, when it's uh, milk-based sugar, like ice cream, uh, or uh, a grain-based treat, you know, like cookies, bread, uh, whatever, um, and chocolate, uh, all of all those three have a particular um, effect on the brain and specifically on the brain's uh, pleasure centers, the endorphin function. So they plug into the endorphin receptors. Instead of having endorphin plugged in, we've got the molecules of gluten, of casein in the case of milk, uh, of chocolate, um, some of the uh, components of chocolate and uh, so people get dependent on them, you know, and they know when endorphin levels drop and they, you know, they, they've been using alcohol for that. Alcohol isn't available anymore. 
they don't know that they can support their own endorphin quickly support their own endorphin production with supplements and with a you know adequate protein diet and so they turn to the drug foods that target the endorphin receptors so the way to to or the the sweets or the desserts or the treats to consume in place of the ice cream or the chocolate or the sweets would be what you would submit? Uh, well, our goal is to eliminate any need for treats, really. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and because of the supplements, that's conceivable. Just as our crack cocaine addict forgot about the fact that his dealer buddy had a joint of caviar, uh, in yes. his pocket. Same thing with, with uh, the ice cream in the freezer. You just forget yeah. about it. It's, it's not screaming at you when your own pleasure chemistry is in operation. Yes. I have one example, though, if someone is craving something, when I want to run by you and, and get your opinion <laughs> on it. 0% fat Greek yogurt. Zero, oh, uh, well, um, Greek yogurt um, is interesting because it does have a fair amount of protein in it. But when someone is addicted, um, so is it sweetened? No, I, I choose the 0% fat, unsweetened Greek unsweetened. yogurt. Unsweetened. And okay. then I put some blueberries in there. And sometimes I'll put a dollop, That's um, apparently that's the word dollop, a dollop of raw honey in it and, and stir it around. Okay. So that's, 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 your, that's your workaround from ice cream. Yes. So you've got, you've got the dairy high plugging into the endorphin receptor from the casein in the milk, in the yogurt. Um, and then you've got um, some uh, high fructose uh, content in the blueberries and definitely in the honey so that uh, you're getting the, the sugar uh high uh in terms of neurochemistry as well so you've got dairy and sugar you know some people the dairy doesn't do a thing for them but to have a piece of whole grain bread with a lot of jam on it that would be their kick mm. uh, for me it's i've just eliminated the consumption of ice cream i don't remember the last time i ate ice cream but you've substituted it Yes, and I can get a 450 gram tub of Greek yogurt, which will give me uh, 35 grams at least of protein. And there's only 350 calories in that thing. And so for me, I'm like, that's a protein bomb. And it's and as it relates to the blueberries, blueberries, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, are very low on the, the glycemic index. Very oh, low. They are. Yeah. yeah, but there's something. Um, yeah, of course, there's something. But for me, it's like a 450 gram tub of Greek yogurt where I'm getting 35 grams of protein, only 350 calories, and I'm throwing some blueberries in there. I'm thinking that's greater than two scoops of ice cream that I might might have with high sugar content. Am I oh, wrong? Oh, it's, it's, it's um, much superior to ice cream, but you're defending your addiction. Um, the fact That's funny. Is, well, in the actual fact, fact is that you want it and only it over and over and over and over. So there's yeah. an addiction component, uh, and and you're asking me what could it be, and I'm saying a combination of the you know for some people the casein addiction is really quite potent. Mm. The specific protein, not the sugar in dairy products, although there is of course lactose, but mm. the protein plugs into the endorphin receptor and mm. then you add if you add honey then you're getting definitely high fructose you know it's about 50 percent high fructose uh syrup and honey mm. you just gave me a wonderful marketing idea for our stop drinking services i can just uh, we in marketing world we 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 say hook the hook which is the first thing that you'd say out of your mouth if you're on a video ad and it was and it is um stop defending your addiction 
yeah. and a big picture of an ice cream bowl or whatever. <laughs> well, in this case, it'll be stop defending your addiction to, to alcohol. You know, oh, I don't drink that much. I only drink on weekends. Oh, oh good. Yeah. Etc. Etc. Et et so you've given me a great video marketing hook to record, Julia. Thank you very much. I, I am conscious of time. We've been going almost one hour and I want to be respectful of your time. And I know we started you. a little bit late as well. So. Yeah. Um, Julia, I, I would you. like to say one thing in response to what you just said, mm. that the, the other thing is, um, if you stop defending your addiction, what are you left with? You're left with shame. I can't control it. It's bad, but I keep doing it. And with the absolute knowledge of the neurotransmitter control of our brain and our appetites. Um, we can honestly say that they are helpless um, and that it isn't their fault. Um, you know, we, I get, you know, like dozens of obese people coming through the program. Did they choose to be obese? Absolutely not. They are helpless. And the reason I can, be absolutely certain about that is that I see them give it up, give up the obesogenic foods overnight when their brain is corrected. So that the fact that you already include an understanding of brain chemistry in your program is um, very impressive. And I think that it's one of the, the, something that you could expand on to actually tell people why why are you doing this? Is it because you're a loser? You're stupid? You know, no. Thank you're a you victim so of, of a malfunctioning brain. Yes. And then also a vic not only a victim of a malfunctioning brain, but a victim of uh, traditional treatments, not articulating this particular methodology. Um, and in many cases, probably for corporate and capitalist reasons. We were speaking to Julia Ross, who is the author of the book, The Craving Cure, also The Mood Cure and The Diet Cure, and the, the director of the Nutritional Therapy Institute's Virtual Clinic and Neuronutrient Therapy Training Programs. Please do check out her books online. That's The Craving Cure, The Mood Cure, and The Diet Cure. Julia Ross, thank you so much for bringing your guidance and expertise to this conversation today. I really appreciate you. You're welcome, James. All the best to you.